gonna I'm gonna share my screen. Just say quick hello. Um, before I do, let's try this and see whether that works. Okay, can you see the uh, yes. slide up there? Brilliant. Okay, hello everybody. Um, thanks for joining us here at Queen Mary. Um, just a quick introduction to who I am. Um, I'm a professor of inhuman geography at Queen Mary, and you might have already got the sense that. Uh, there's lots of different geographies you can do. There's also lots of different kind of geographers you can be. Um, so my work, um, I come from a background in climate change, polar geographies, uh, and more recently I've been working on questions of race, geology, uh, and the environment. And that's what I wanted to sort of talk to you a bit about today, is some of these kind of geographies of nature, the environment, and how that intersects with questions of social and racial justice. So I thought we'd look at today the kind of question of race and the environment, um, but really how it intersects with this question of justice. So how are environmental justice issues also racial justice issues? And how does this kind of change the way in which we may think about uh, people and the environment? So one of the areas uh, in geography that I've been really interested in is this um, new term uh, of a new geologic epoch called the Anthropocene. And you may or may not have heard of this term, but it's an informal geologic chronological term that is uh, set to kind of mark and evidence the extent of human activities um, that have impacted on the global environment. So this is human-driven alterations of all all uh, kind of changes uh, of the biophysical world. So, uh, and particularly uh, the atmosphere, but also the major kind of flows of elements in the atmosphere and in the air uh, and the energy balance at the Earth's surface. So I'm particularly interested in how things from mining, for example, actually rearrange um, the atmosphere. So there's kind of movement across vertical geographies rather than sort of more horizontal um, geographies. But the key point about the, uh, the Anthropocene um, is really to think about how the Earth has left um, a, uh, what is, termed a natural uh, geologic epoch. Um, it's certainly uh, heading towards a different state to the Holocene um, and um, how we can begin to think about this shift in planetary terms. So this is not just about the impact on localized environments, but it's the impact on the whole planet. So one of the kind of questions has been for scholars that are interested in this term, the Anthropocene, is what does it mean for thinking about human, earth, environmental and social relations? So really, how do we think about the Anthropocene when we're used to dividing geography up into human geography and physical geography? So if the Anthropocene is about the human uh, impact on the earth that's changed the geology of the earth, then we need to begin to think about these things in a much more joined up way. Um, so one of the terms that myself and a colleague have come up with is really to think about geosocial formation. So to really think about how um, the geo and the social are kind of entwined. But as a geographer, we might also want to go back and think about how we understand this new epoch within the context of the ways in which new ideas of the world have circulated. So you may be familiar with this uh, image of Vermeer's The Geographer. It was a painting uh, made in 1669 and it engaged and demonstrated the importance of vision. Uh, within the discipline of geography. So thinking about looking, imagining, measuring, but also producing representations of the earth. And that's one of the key ways in which geographers have understood and produced knowledge about the world. And that's through a visual lens and through these kind of cartographic practices. So if we think about the earth being the principal uh, object of geographical study. We can also think about how we represent uh, the world and how this changes the shape of the world. So how actually representation is really entwined with actions uh, and um, how we kind of perceive the world and act on it. 
But we also need to think about this we, who is the we, who is the kind of the, the people producing representations uh, and therefore kind of being in charge of change in the world. So one of the things that I've been interested in doing is looking at these kind of historical shifts in how we see the world and to think about some of the major shifts um, from aerial views that really recontextualized the idea of the environment and gave kind of scope to imagine new environmental issues. Um, you're probably all familiar with the satellite view or what's called the view from above that first pictured the world in its sort of entirety and showed us the impact of weather, the poles, etc. But also was a technology of Cold War geopolitics. It was about demonstrating an ability to control aerial space in a military sense. Alongside this emerged questions and ideas about one world, one earth, an interconnected earth. And this is really how the discourse of sustainability emerges from this uh, report called Our Common Future, um, which was produced in 1989 as part of an international gathering um, that came together to suggest that um, the earth uh, needed to be kind of uh, have economic ec activity reconciled with environmental sustainability. And this kind of first is probably the first iteration of world sustainability and the idea of a sustainable environment as kind of part of um, uh, economic uh, geographical model. Uh, alongside this, there's several kind of theories of the planet emerged. Um, uh, James Lovelock's Gaia, that you're probably familiar, and one that you're probably not so familiar with, Lynn Margulis' notion of a symbolic, symbiotic planet. So symbiotic planet looks at the role of bacteria uh, and minute life forms in changing the planet, whereas Lovelock's uh, models look at um, the impact of kind of of large earth processes. Um, so those two kind of um, theories emerged in the 1970s and they really kind of fostered an idea um, in the sciences and the geologic sciences, um, particularly of these kind of shifting planets and of humans as an agent within those kind of shifting geochemical uh, uh, planets. And then a kind of massive change and shift again uh, in the geologic science, sciences was a shift to remote sensing and the ability to uh, sense in real time um, the planet as a whole entity. And this changed the way uh, uh, physical uh, geographical sciences were undertaken, um, but also the ability to maneuver around the world and produce images of the world, but also to kind of see um, in real time um, various forms of devastation and environmental impact um, emerging. So things like fires, for example, um, all sorts of um, environmental impacts um, caused by hurricanes and natural natural events um, could be kind of pictured and understood in real time. And the development of remote sensing that led to the, um, along with lots of collected atmospheric data models, the generation uh, of what was called general, general circulation models. So the models that underpin all our knowledge of climate change um, and um, helped scientists predict uh, shifts in global climate. And this really gave us a kind of image of the world as kind of a planetary sphere connected through um, the production of fossil fuels uh, and other um, generations of greenhouse gases. So we can think about global visions as being really responsible for conceiving and representing our understanding of the environment and the kind of earth as this unitary uh, regular body um, of, um, of kind of impact in a sense. Um, so that imagination, that geographical imagination um, has been really key to the production of Western knowledge about the environment. 
So we might want to kind of think about what kind of age is the Anthropocene. Um, obviously, we have these kind of global visions that picture a whole Earth, um, but we know that the kind of impacts of the Anthropocene uh, materially define um, at all sorts of levels and scales. So um, some people have suggested that should be called the Plasticine um, after all the plastics that are in the world. Uh, other people have suggested that we may look at the beginnings of colonialism, for example, as one start or the use of nuclear technologies and nuclear radiation uh, in the Earth. So there's lots of different ways in which we can think about how to define uh, the material impact of humans on the planet. Other people have suggested that we ought to look at economic models as driving uh, planetary change, suggesting the Catholicine, for example, as a way to think through the material effects of the economic systems of capitalism. Um, so they propose that a sustainable future is impossible without generating new modes of economic and social exchange. So if we're going to think about social systems as geologic systems, we also need to think about capitalism as a geologic force. And this is quite different to the ways in which we're used to learning about uh, the environment. So you might want to think if you can think up of any other names for the e epoch that define uh, human engagement with the planet and maybe we can pick up on some of those in the discussion later. So for me this comes down to a question about how do we know what nature is, how do we know what the earth is. And if geography is not self-evident, if geography is not this independent reality out there, it's actually a contested reality, whose nature gets the count? And how is it constructed and contested? So one of the ways in which uh, we might want to uncover and respond to this question is really to think about, well, how have geographies been represented? And one of the key ways in which geographies have been represented is through a kind of colonial lens. So we might want to take a look at post-colonial natures and think about the way in which geographers um, pictured uh, and depicted the world often um, with through that colonial lens um, as a kind of outline of a country filled with resources um, and often indigenous peoples were mapped into those places as part of the flora and fauna. Um, so we can see that the aerial view happens much earlier within the kind of um, colonial context. So in geography, we have a term from this, uh, which we call imaginative geography. So the representations of place, space and landscape that structure people's understanding of the world and in turn help shape their actions. So we can see representation and representation of geographies, they're really key to thinking about uh, both questions of power over landscape, um, but also how people are and places are treated. So this kind of, um, and to think really critically about who is the we um, from which that view comes. So post-colonial analysis and deconstructions to the methods we might use in geography is really to kind of question about how, why, and for whom are images constructed. So the maps and images of colonies were generally constructed by colonizers for those colonizers and for extraction. So we can think about who benefits from this existence, what messages are conveyed, how maps assert, colonial colonizers authority over and claim to landscape. The maps in themselves are a form of colonization. We might also want to think about what's included and what's excluded. Whose prior ownership to land, for example, is excluded from uh, colonial cartographies? What attachments to place are removed in that cartographic practice? So, we can think about representations both as depicting something, but also constraining interpretation. So actually uh, reducing and erasing, in, in some cases, uh, the uh, 
sets of relationships within landscapes and environments. Often they're rendered empty, unpopulated and uncivilized. So we also need to think kind of critically and creatively in geography about how images can be reconstructed, how representations can be reconstructed so that we can actually creatively generate new images of place and uh, think about uh, those uh, places from the perspective of people already living there or people that have been um, kind of impacted by colonialism. But we can see this kind of question of contested natures all around us um, from how land is used uh, to what it's used for, um, whether the countryside is a kind of royal, uh, 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 kind of um, seen as a um, rural uh, idyll, or whether it's used for farming, whether it's used for fracking, whether it's used for festivals. Um, but also down to what happens to local woodland, what happens in terms of planning of green space, etc. We can also think about this question through inclusions and inclusions of non-humans. So one of the areas that I work in is around non-human geographies, really thinking about the interactions with non-humans in city spaces. Um, that goes from everything to do with climate change to um, animals that live in the city. Um, so often we've invited certain animals into the city and expelled other animals. Uh, the animals we like, we keep as pets. The animals we don't like, we tend to eradicate um, or push out to rural areas, so uh, into, um, into farm land. So during the kind of um, 18th, 19th century, London was full of livestock markets. Um, that was, livestock was a familiar part of urban life. This is Spitalfields Market here. But during the 19th century, the geographies of animals that we eat uh, got pushed out into um, the rural environment and out of the city. And then certain animals become coded as urban animals, whereas others are seen as, uh, as kind of belonging to other places. And we think about these kind of animals that are in the city, uh, what are often referred to as trash animals, because they uh, live often off human waste or human kind of byproducts. Um, there's also escaped animals and conflicts between uh, different animals, wild animals, domestic animals within urban space. Um, so we can see these as contest contested geographies that humans are often involved in managing um, and through particular attachments to certain animals and uh, non-attachments to others. So if we think about um, kind of natures in the city, we also need to think about how our idea of um, things like uh, the wilderness, the kind of construct of uh, nature out there, is also constructed, imagined and represented. And one of the places we might do this is in the museum. So museums tell us a story about nature, particularly natural history museums. Uh, and they tell us about a world of na nature that has been produced in a sense, in a certain kind of image as um, outside of human activity. And this is a diorama here from the New York Natural History Museum. And it's very much an image of untouched uh, nature, a wilderness, but it's an entirely constructed scene. It's been made um, by hunters, by museum curators, by an imagination of the wilderness. And these uh, questions about the representation are actively being uh, contested, uh, often by Indigenous people um, and Indigenous um, groups that are calling for the decolonization um, to reclaim and reimagine um, ideas of nature um, outside of these colonial depictions that often depicted uh, indigenous and racialized people within the context of the museum as nature. So uh, this statue outside of uh, the Natural History Museum in New York um, uh, every day on Indigenous Peoples Day would have blood poured over it. It's since been removed 
um, because it depicts a racial hierarchy um, of indigenous uh, and white people outside of the museum. And it structured the imagination of the museum as a racialized space. So we can think about these connections between colonial natures, a particular kind of idea of nature and uh, ideas of race and how that continues to impact on uh, people in uh, the present day. So a quick question for you here, uh, two dinosaurs in the uh, lobby to the Natural History Museum in New York. What have, what have dinosaurs got to do with nation? Why are these dinosaurs involved in nation building and how are they involved in nation building? How I, we think about these geographies of dinosaurs as being imbued in a political geography. So one way that we can think about this is to think about the role of nature in state formation. So in the formation of a political, uh, particular political state. So in the entrance hall to the museum, there's three plaques, one to youth, um, sorry, four plaques, one to youth, one to manhood, one to state and one to nature. And these are all seen as connected. So um, through patriarchy, through the state and through nature, a certain idea of uh, the state of America emerges. So in this kind of dramatic representation of dinosaurs fighting, um, there's a imagination of a prehistoric encounter between predator and prey. And that mimics the myth uh, in the US between the kind of conquest station of the land um, over indigenous people. So uh, nature is seen as a battleground. It's uh, connected as a kind of, as a war, as a uh, set of conflicts between uh, different groups here represented by uh, the dinosaurs. The other side of the kind of less uh, overtly violent side in terms of representation of colonial natures is through kind of uh, landscape painting and also painting of other people uh, and places. So there was a great romance around the ideas of nature um, in kind of colonial projects that attached people and places together as part of a kind of wild frontier, so part of a kind of frontier that needed to be conquered. So cultural geographers have studied travel writing and images from this period, and they're really interested in how nature is used to communicate messages uh, and understandings about other people and other places. And really to make these distinctions in colonial nature, between the wild and untamed and the cultural and the civilized in European society. If we look at other kinds of um, beginnings to uh, colonial geographies, Simon Lewis and Mark Maslin have argued that the Anthropocene began in 1600 with what they call the Columbian Exchange. So this massive movement of foods, of diseases, of animals um, from um, Europe to the Americas via Africa. But another name for this exchange is genocide. Uh, 50,000 million people, uh, 50 million people died in the Americas from the direct violence and disease of European settlers. So the exchange was not exactly a, um, a exchange built on consent or reciprocity. It involved uh, geographies of violence and it involved uh, settler colonial. Um, occupation of indigenous lands. So we can see that both with humans, there's also massive non-human geographies involved in the kind of 
um, movement of things around the earth. You think about um, colonial geographies are not just about humans and their impact, but it's about all the livestock they brought that changed ecologies, that brought both disease, but also just changed the kind of earth itself through all the kind of, um, particularly through hoofed uh, animals. So when we go back to the museum, we might look at these images of settlement through different eyes. We might ask questions about what kind of nature is being portrayed here, what kinds of interactions, uh, and who are these images for? What power has been depicted? And what kind of um, what kind of uh, discourse, what we might call a set of ideas, a set of imaginations about place are uh, being, uh, uh, being uh, produced. So in the museum, they're starting to address some of the issues around coloniality. So here we have the image of the so-called exchange, where we have an indigenous person bringing gifts to the colonizers. Um, but what did that actually look like? As geographers, we need to be critical in how we examine these geographers and actually think about the, um, as Molly Miller there, one of the indigenous peoples from the Lenape tribe talks about, the early years of colonization caused much intergenerational trauma and the hiding of culture. And you can also see the structuring of things like uh, gender relations in this image. So um, uh, the, the exchange is happening between two men, the women are in the background, which is not actually uh, the context of the Lenape uh, society. Um, so colonialism overwrites a whole range of diverse interactions and um, cultures uh, in its own image. So we have this term settler colonialism um, that talks about uh, and kind of encapsulates the role of European um, geographies in settling, um, settling um, kind of countries. But in, in essence, settlement was a violent uh, and a deeply um, kind of ecologically uh, as well as culturally and socially damaging uh, process. It, it was a very different experience to um, the people that lived uh, in uh, those countries. So when we talk about questions of decolonization, particularly in geography, we need to think with those long histories and think about how they come to bear on the present. So as I said, the kind of um, the massive exchange um, and movement of people, um, particularly um, kind of uh, the impact on enslaved Africans and indigenous people completely changed the geographies uh, of the world. And it created a sense of a global world, but a very unequal global world. And it set in place um, uh, unequal environments uh, in that process. It damaged uh, cultural understandings and cosmologies, as well as actually impoverishing uh, certain groups of uh, targeted people uh, and, uh, and uh, ecologies. So the Anthropocene, in a sense, is the fruition of all these uh, geographical and cultural processes. And this is why we see a lot of the um, protests around the world by indigenous people being led around uh, things like resource extraction, around different ideas of nature and of what to do with nature. So resistance to settler colonialism is also resistance to settler colonial natures. So to extraction, to um, the use of the land in particular kinds of ways. And this is the Dakota Access oil pipe uh, protest at Standing Rock in 2016, which you may have seen in the news. And the message from the indigenous groups that have um, joined in solidarity around that process was water is life. So a different cosmology and understanding of, of nature uh, and what nature is and how it should be used.
So we can think about geographies of colonialism as an ongoing system, not a past event. It's not something that happened in 1492, um, but something that continues to structure the way in which we engage with natures, with groups of people, uh, and the long lasting impacts, particularly of slavery and indigenous dispossession. So we continue to dispossess indigenous and black peoples in terms of environmental racism. So this helps us understand racism, not just as an ideological event, but actually as an environment, as something that uh, a geographical infrastructure that continues to impact people today. So if we look at this kind of image, um, this is a painting called Progress. We can see the imagination and we can depict as geographers, we can unpick as geographers what's going on in this scene around settler colonialism. We can see the buffalo and the native um, Americans being chased out by uh, this lady called Progress. So it's a very gendered image of uh, progress as a white woman coming across the landscape, but also this image of settler colonialism bringing new farming technologies, new um, technologies of steam and rail, but also of the horse, uh, of different kinds of uh, impacts on the environment. Um, so when we think about uh, these terms like progress, like civilization, Western technology, we can also see that they have histories. These terms uh, have histories and they have impacts that have been part of a very violent form of conquest and settlement. And this is what uh, climate justice uh, activists pick up today in bringing together the question of climate justice and racial justice, because nation, race, gender, sexuality, and class all converged in a history of the geographies of colonialism and the invasion of land. And this question returns to us today in questions around climate and questions around who has been impacted by climate change and who, uh, must, who is actually bearing the brunt of those impacts and those relation to uh, past geographies of harm. So we can see here, this is uh, what's called the Orbis spike. We can see here at the beginning in 1692, there's a dip in CO2. And this is due to the invasion in the Americas and the impact on indigenous people um, through um, the, through the kind of genocide of indigenous people, um, that there's actually a dip in uh, CO2 production because all the forest grows, grew back. So the, the forms of husbandry that indigenous people had used in keeping the forests um, was interrupted by colonialism. And then we have this um, spike right up to the present of the, um, intensifying uh, CO2 production. And we're now at sort of 410 um, parts per million. So we can see the impact of colonialism in um, climate uh, records. Uh, we can see the impact of colonialism informing uh, the idea of the Anthropocene. And so we can really begin to think about these histories of colonialism in connection with environments and environmental consequences as a form of geosocial formations. So environmental justice is racial justice. Um, and this was very evident, has been very evident in uh, the struggle for human rights in the US, um, particularly around um, questions of um, social justice and access to uh, clean environments. So the first, um, the first kind of recorded uh, uh, protest around environmental justice happened in 1968, Martha Luther, Martha Luther King going to Memphis to support garbage workers. And then again in 1979, black residents um, were campaigning against a proposed landfill. Uh, and brought a lawsuit against the management uh, company. And that was the first lawsuit in the US to challenge the uh, siting of waste facilities under a civil rights um, banner. 
So the sighting of PCB landfills again came up in one county in North Carolina um, as a um, issue of social justice uh, and disobedience. And it was here that the term environmental racism was coined. coined. And the term environmental racism sought to capture the um, coming together of racism, of sighting of hazardous waste near um, black um, and brown communities uh, and um, the impact on the continued impact of those sightings on those communities. So the report found that in eight south southeastern US states, three out of four commercial hazardous waste facilities were located in mostly black neighborhoods, even though the region was only 20% um, black overall. So the targeting of waste facilities to black, um, often poor um, neighborhoods became known as um, through this lens of environmental racism, um, where the targeting of communities of color for toxic waste disposal and other polluting industries was used as a, um, as a mechanism for uh, outsourcing uh, waste to poor marginalized community. But it was also combined with the excluding of people of color from environmental groups, from decision-making boards, commissions, and regulatory bodies. So it was also about the exclusion within the environmental community itself uh, and its regulation. So there's historic infrastructures of discrimination that emerged through slavery and settler colonialism keep on returning in questions of environmental justice. So the Commission for Racial Justice, when they published their report in 1987, they um, set out um, based on the evidence submitted that race was more of a factor than class in the geography of hazardous waste disposal. And now race is used as an indicator for environmental harm in the US. So race is the best predictor of exposure to environmental hazards. So we can think about these impacts of racialization on health differences, on access to environments and the benefits of clean environments, but also ongoing health issues around um, kind of the impact of those exposures um, on people's um, health and uh, their underlying health status. So the environmental justice movement really emerged out of um, the treatment of black and brown people in terms of um, environmental impacts and access to um, uh, environmentally uh, rich spaces. So environmental justice was a response to environmental racism. And the first principles of environmental justice were developed to the First Nation People of Color Environmental Leadership Summit in 1991. So it, def it defined a movement that was um, based around joining together questions of social justice, of racial justice with environmental justice. And I won't go through the principles of environmental justice, but Essentially, it mandates the right as a human right to uh, environmental resources and land and health. And later in 1990, the EPA created a working group in response to the findings that racial minorities and low income populations bore a higher environmental risk burden than the general population. So we can see this as targeted at particular communities. But we see these kind of uh, questions around institutional racism within the environmental uh, movement as ongoing. So uh, while environmental issues disproportionately impact people of color, Often people are, um, this is a, the uh, image by um, the AP um, photographers and they cropped out uh, Vanessa Vash, who was, um, who was a, a black environmental um, activist out of the photo. You probably saw that um, erupt on Twitter. 
but it's very it's a very clear indication of the way in which um, the kind of discourse of environmentalism often uh, excludes and um, marginalized um, both within the institutions of environmentalism as well as outside of those institutions. Uh, we can also see it in cities in the US where that have been redlined, um, which actually segregated um, uh, communities based on race. And the hottest parts of town with the least um, trees and the least kind of shade and coverance. Um, so the most affected by climate change are those areas that were racialized through city planning. And the areas that are most kind of uh, palatial in terms of tree coverage, shade uh, and green space are those historically uh, white neighborhoods. So this leads a lot of climate uh, activists to really reject the idea of a climate apartheid that emerges out of these disproportionate impacts of climate change. Um, because these build on historical um, segregation and marginalization of people. Um, so one of the things that we th need to think about when we think about global models is really to think about this question of how um, the we of global environments, the we of the Anthropocene um, is actually um, much more nuanced, much more uh, um, kind of divided and marginalized um, than um, we uh, is often pictured in kind of images of the globe. So just to um, just to sort of conclude here, we might think about environmental pollution as a global problem, but it builds on existing inequalities and it further impacts racialized communities. And this is um, reports around kind of the impact on BME and uh, racialized poor Londoners um, uh, in terms of air quality. So while kind of the Anthropocene is a global issue and we can see the impact of poor air quality, for example, and its sort of relation to climate change um, on cities around the world. So it's a, a problem of world cities. It's also a problem um, that hits in um, people in very kind of unequal ways um, and is part of an ongoing uh, colonial set of approaches to nature um, that prioritize uh, um, uh, a few in favor um, of, well, prioritize uh, the industrialized nations over um, the global south, um, but also kind of um, the richest parts of society over uh, the racialized poor. So as Desmond Tutu uh, suggested, recent um, uh, sustainability seminar, we do not need climate change apartheid in adaptation. So when we're thinking about solutions to climate change, we're thinking about um, sustainability. We need to really bear in mind that adaptation doesn't just become social injustice on a global set, um, scale. And to really think about the intersectional uh, analysis of ecological issues. So uh, just to conclude, we may think about uneven geographies of the environment uh, and to think about how our representations and framings of the environment really contribute to our understanding of, um, of who and what is impacted by environmental change. So the power to represent is also a power to dominate, a power to offer solutions, um, and it's a power over uh, as much as um, a, a recognition of a particular environmental problem. And I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Catherine. Um, I guess we can take um, some questions now from our online audience and our in-person audience. Um, does anyone have any questions for Catherine? Um, we've also got Amir as well, who's our student ambassador. So feel free to ask any questions to, to Amir as well. 
the Q&A box should be open, so you should be able to pop some questions in there. Any questions in the room about the talk? Yeah, sure, Catherine. A wonderful talk, covered so much. Um, just at the end, you talked about um, the comments of adaptation being sort of excusing or masking injustice. Just explain that a little bit more. Um, what's behind that? Sure. Um, I think, I mean, a lot of the um, questions around adaptation to climate change have been um, concerned with uh, forms of mitigation um, that actually kind of um, make uh, conditions worse for indigenous people rather than better. So we can think about something like uh, carbon offsetting, for example, um, that has been uh, involved in the privatization of indigenous lands and uh, forests, um, and actually has really negatively impacted um, uh, indigenous people rather than actually, um, you know, so contributing or solving the problem of climate change. So I think when the, when those solutions tend to be technological or capitalist-led solutions uh, and don't actually take into concern um, the impact on indigenous and uh, other communities, I think that's when adaptation starts to kind of um, look a lot like uh, colonialism. Great, thank you. Um, it reminds me of a really interesting program I heard uh, recently, which was talking about uh, shifts towards carbon neutral transport technologies, which really require rare earths. So um, there's this sort of scramble now for extracting rare earths from different countries, which is replicating mainly the extractive, things of extractive colonialism and capitalism. But in favor of or under the banner of green technologies, which is really disturbing to see that sort of reproduction, that sense of nature as a resource, you know, to be used to keep our capitalist system going, but under the banner of green technologies, so complex issues. But I guess that's part of what you were getting at with that, that idea of adaptation as a uh, yeah, I, and I think, yeah, obviously, you know, in, in being geographers that we want to be kind of um, both sort of critical, but also ge help generate uh, solutions to climate change and to sustainable practice. But I think kind of looking at some of these kind of histories of engagement really help us think about uh, how we move forward um, with those um, solutions. Uh, in ways that don't reproduce um, past harms. Maybe while we're waiting for more questions, Amir, do you want to maybe introduce yourself, what course you're studying, yeah, sure. and a bit more about how you're finding it? So, so my name is Amir Hassan. Um, I am from Manchester, or well, New Zealand. Um, I'm currently in my fourth year at Green Mary's as a physical instructor and a year abroad student. Uh, so I was in America last year, uh, the University of Texas, and so the geological sciences, and I um, was there for a while to do it Yeah, so I applied as a scientist former um, back in the days of one of the sponsors, so I was in general. Um, but yeah, so that's how I got in. Um, and yeah, it's been, it's been great. I've done a big mix of modules and trials. So, even modules, physical modules. I'd say that each semester I probably have sort of like at least one human module out of three. Um, so, it's, it's been nice to have that mix. Um, you can always, like, vice versa, a lot of friends who are on the BA, who have a uh, degree, but they also do a physical module as well. Um, so, it's nice to have that mix. I, I, I don't think. I really get that with any other degree, really. So, say, for example, you know, that degree for that uh, they don't have that sort of ability to be able to study something else um, that's kind of just outside of what their actual degree still is. Um, so, I've really enjoyed that aspect of doing jobs at the university. Um, yeah, and the, the year abroad thing is probably a highlight um, of my sort of degree, um, just being able to study in a different institution. Um, 
with different sort of teaching um, approaches. Uh, it's really interesting. Any questions for Amir? Yeah. It could be from anything to maybe Amir's favourite module, what Amir does outside of his studies, university in general, it could be anything. Have you guys all definitely decided you want to go to this? Yeah. yeah. So on that side, that was a little bit, yeah. What would you say your main sort of like internal What would you say like your main reasons are like having a bit of Yeah, definitely, definitely. I'd say that's that's one thing that I sort of was debating as well when I was university. Um, but at the time, I didn't have anything that I specifically wanted to do. And I feel like if you do the apprenticeship uh, thing, it's great. If you know what you want to do, hundred percent, like you know, definitely want to do this. Like, perfect. Um, but if you are sort of unsure, definitely a degree like geography is great because I've got like all of my friends that are on the geography degree. We're all we all have different career path sort of like ideas. Um, and it ranges from like consultancy work and like big companies or like you know like startup companies like random stuff I want to get into um, operations um future so it's like it's not really really a geography but that's the sort of skill that you learn with a degree like geography and that take you so many different places that I'm only really sort of starting to realize now when I kind of don't uh, employers love people that are geography it's very open to opportunities um and opposed to sort of other degrees where you know you might single yourself down if you did like urban you know, law or economics. I'm just a big geography fan, so <laughs> not bad at all, but um, but but yeah, it does give you a lot of And Amir, can you what A levels did you do? Oh, so I did uh, Spanish, geography, and biology. Um I didn't like biology at all. I found it really not necessarily difficult, but I just didn't enjoy it. Um, so I didn't, I didn't want to take that any further. Spanish, um, probably was my favorite subject at level, um, as, 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 alongside poetry, obviously. Um, but yeah, so I always knew from high school that I wanted to go to a year. Um, Spanish was just sort of more of a hobby. Um, but yeah, those three, I think, are all out of the three of them, definitely. Biology kind of is good. Like slightly relates to environmental science a little bit, especially at uni. Um, it's quite the ecology of books, but about the Well, another question for me. <laughs> how did you find it, um, the transition from like your A level studies to university, and how did you, what did you do to sort of adjust to the differences? So I actually really preferred like university. Like way of teaching and studying is very more very very much more individual. So you have a lot of things to do on your own. I know it might sound a bit scary now, um, but sort of you can pursue your own interests rather than a sort of a teacher saying, okay, this is our exam, this is your assignment, whatever, and you have to know this, this, and this in order to pass the exam or you know, uh, complete your assignment. Um, but I'd say in university it's more sort of, you know, you, you'll get in some modules, you're given a set of questions, you have to sort of create a response to the module, you'll just be given complete freedom to make your own question or own answer to a certain assignment, uh, which I prefer because you can sort of uh, delve into your own interests a lot more, which makes the studying a lot more interesting rather than, you know, okay, here's a book, front end, this is all you need to know, and as long as you know it all, then you're all right. Um, um, so, yeah, I'd say that aspect of the university, being able to take the content from your lectures and uh, seminars and then sort of put your own spin on it. It's all more individual. Um, and I feel like I enjoy learning at university a lot more than I enjoy learning at uh, uh, classes. Any questions yet?
I got one more. <laughs> um, so you are you're originally from Manchester. What made you decide to move to London or choose a university in London to study at? Um, I always had quite a lot of friends here, so I was born here. Um, so that was probably one thing. So probably not really that could sort of screen my decision. Um, but apart from that, I went to sort of get a bit of independence, move away from home. Um, I love the idea of studying in London because it's so many universities, so many students. Um, that was probably another thing. Um, you know, whereas if you went to say like Manchester, for example, it's like uni art, man, man, but like a small student community, where the London's very broad, there's a lot of like into university societies as well. So like different unis will have like events with other unis, which is pretty cool. Um, and then obviously the career opportunities as well, that's the big thing. Um, especially at the minute, it's kind of hard to find graduate um, opportunities. Um, so that's probably a big thing that took so well. Yeah. And do you, do you live on campus? So. In my first year, I did. I lived in, uh, in Hall my first year, which was probably the best sort of living mm. experience I've had in the so far. Um, and then my second and third year, I lived just off campus, but around, around in the general area, it's not, not too far away. Amazing. Um, and maybe to end it off, Dim, is there any advice you'd give to um, our Singapore students right now? What kind of things should they be thinking about? I would say definitely before you do go to any university or sort of apply for any course and look at the modules that they offer. Um, look at the, the staff that sort of lecture there, teach there, what their um, key like sort of areas of research are, because that will uh, definitely influence the modules that are on offer. Um, alongside, say, for example, geography, you have a dissertation for the um, sort of uh, connection between you and your advisor is quite important. Um, I feel like if you're sort of attracted to the general lack like, of ethos of the staff and how they sort of what they do in like as, as research researchers, um, that's very important. I'd say look at the modules if you like them, if you think they're going to be interesting. That, that's a big thing that I didn't really consider before I applied. Um, I don't really think, of, think about it as like it much of a thing because you know in in six form you have like a set set like uh, curriculum so there's no like variation whereas in uni especially in geography it's so broad so definitely I, I, I consider it a positive for or amazing thank you so much Catherine and Amir for today's session um. We will have more of these sessions um, each month, so do keep an eye out on our website um, and sign up to those. And yeah, you, if you do have any questions at a later date, I'll put our um, email address in the chat um, and you can just sort of save that for if you have any questions later on. But thank you so much and hopefully we'll see some of you soon. Great. Thank you, Catherine. <laughs> oh, yeah. There you go.